Chapter 50 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson. The Vision of Mirza. When I was at Grand Cairo, I picked up several Oriental manuscripts which I have still by me. Among others, I met with one entitled The Visions of Mirza, which I have read over with great pleasure. I intend to give it to the public when I have no other entertainment for them, and shall begin with the first vision, which I have translated word for word as follows. On the fifth day of the moon, which, according to the custom of my forefathers, I always keep holy, after having washed myself, and offered up my morning devotions, I ascended the high hills of Baghdad in order to pass the rest of the day in meditation and prayer. As I was here airing myself on the tops of the mountains, I fell into a profound contemplation on the vanity of human life, and passing from one thought to another, surely, said I, man is but a shadow, and life a dream. Whilst I was thus musing, I cast my eyes toward the summit of a rock that was not far from me, where I discovered one in the habit of a shepherd, with a little musical instrument in his hand. As I looked upon him, he applied it to his lips, and began to play upon it. The sound of it was exceeding sweet, and wrought into a variety of tunes that were inexpressibly melodious, and altogether different from anything I had ever heard. They put me in mind of those heavenly airs that are played to the departed souls of good men upon their first arrival in paradise, to wear out the impressions of the last agonies, and qualify them for the pleasures of that happy place. My heart melted away in secret raptures. I had been often told that the rock before me was the haunt of a genius, and that several had been entertained with music who had passed by it but never heard that the musician had before made himself visible. When he had raised my thoughts by those transporting airs which he played, to taste the pleasures of his conversation, as I looked upon him like one astonished, thereupon he beckoned to me, and by the waving of his hand directed me to approach the place where he sat. I drew near with that reverence which is due to a superior nature, and as my heart was entirely subdued by the captivating strains I had heard, I fell down at his feet and wept. The genius smiled upon me with a look of compassion and affability that familiarized him to my imagination, and at once dispelled all the fears and apprehensions with which I approached him. He lifted me from the ground, and taking me by the hand, Mirza, said he, I have heard thee in thy soliloquies, follow me he then led me to the highest pinnacle of the rock and placing me on the top of it cast thy eyes eastward said he and tell me what thou seest i see said i a huge valley and a prodigious tide of water rolling through it the valley that thou seest said he is the veil of misery and the tide of water that thou seest is part of the great tide of eternity what is the reason, said I, that the tide I see rises out of a thick mist at one end, and again loses itself in a thick mist at the other? What thou seest, said he, is that portion of eternity which is called time, measured out by the sun, and reaching from the beginning of the world to its consummation. Examine now, said he, this sea that is bounded with darkness at both ends, and tell me what thou discoverest in it. I see a bridge, said I, standing in the midst of the tide. The bridge thou seest, said he, is human life. Consider it attentively. Upon a more leisurely survey of it, I found that it consisted of three score and ten entire arches, with several broken arches, which, added to those that were entire, made up the number about an hundred. As I was counting the arches, the genius told me that this bridge had consisted at first of a thousand arches, but that a great flood swept away the rest, 
and left the bridge in the ruinous condition i now beheld it but tell me further said he what thou discoverest on it i see multitudes of people passing over it said i and a black cloud hanging on each end of it as i looked more attentively i saw several of the passengers dropping through the bridge into the great tide that flowed underneath it and upon further examination perceived that there were innumerable trap-doors that lay concealed in the bridge which the passengers no sooner trod upon but they fell through them into the tide and immediately disappeared these hidden pitfalls were set very thick at the entrance of the bridge so that the throngs of people no sooner broke through the cloud but many of them fell into them they grew thinner towards the middle but multiplied and lay closer together towards the end of the arches that were entire there were indeed some persons but their numbers were very small that continued a kind of hobbling march on the broken arches but fell through one after another being quite tired and spent with so long a walk i passed some time in the contemplation of this wonderful structure and the great variety of objects which it presented my heart was filled with a deep melancholy to see several dropping unexpectedly in the midst of mirth and jollity and catching at everything that stood by them to save themselves some were looking up towards the heavens in a thoughtful posture and in the midst of a speculation stumbled and fell out of sight multitudes were very busy in the pursuit of bubbles that glittered in their eyes and danced before them but often when they thought themselves within reach of them their footing failed and down they sunk in this confusion of objects i observed some with scimitars in their hands who ran to and fro upon the bridge thrusting several persons on trap-doors which did not to seem to lie in their way and which they might have escaped had they not been thus forced upon them the genius seeing me indulge myself on this melancholy prospect told me that i had dwelt long enough upon it take thine eyes off the bridge said he and tell me if thou yet seest anything thou dost not comprehend upon looking up what mean said i those great flights of birds that are perpetually hovering above the bridge and settling upon it from time to time i see vultures harpies ravens cormorants and among many other feathered creatures several little winged boys that perch in great numbers upon the middle arches these said the genius are envy avarice superstition despair love with the like cares and passions that infest human life i here fetched a deep sigh alas said i man was made in vain how is he given away to misery and mortality tortured in life and swallowed up in death the genius being moved with compassion towards me bid me quit so uncomfortable a prospect look no more said he on man in the first stage of his existence in his setting out for eternity but cast thine eye on that thick mist into which the tide bears the several generations of mortals that fall into it i directed my sight as i was ordered and whether or no the good genius strengthened it with any supernatural force or dissipated part of the mist that was before too thick for the eye to penetrate i saw the valley opening at the farther end and spreading forth into an immense ocean that had a huge rock of adamant running through the midst of it and dividing it into two equal parts the clouds still rested on one half of it insomuch that i could discover nothing in it but the other appeared to me a vast ocean planted with innumerable islands that were covered with fruits and flowers and interwoven with a thousand little shining seas that ran among them i could see persons dressed in glorious habits with garlands upon their heads passing among the trees lying down by the side of fountains or resting on beds of flowers and could hear a confused harmony of singing birds falling waters human voices and musical instruments gladness grew in me upon the discovery of so delightful a scene i wished for the wings of an eagle that i might fly away to those happy seats but the genius told me there was no passage to them except through the gates of death which i saw opening every moment upon the bridge the islands said he that lie so fresh and green before thee 
and with which the whole face of the ocean appears spotted as far as thou canst see are more in number than the sands on the seashore there are myriads of islands behind those which thou here discoverest reaching farther than thine eye or even thine imagination can extend itself these are the mansions of good men after death who according to the degree and kinds of virtue in which they excelled are distributed among those several islands which abound with pleasures of different kinds and degrees suitable to the relishes and perfections of those who are settled in them every island is a paradise accommodated to its respective inhabitants are not these o mirza habitations worth contending for does life appear miserable that gives thee opportunities of earning such a reward is death to be feared that will convey thee to so happy an existence think not man was made in vain who has such an eternity reserved for him i gazed with inexpressible pleasure on these happy islands at length i said show me now i beseech thee the secrets that lie hid under those dark clouds which cover the ocean on the other side of the rock of adamant the genius making me no answer i turned about to address myself to him a second time but found that he had left me i then turned again to the vision which i had been so long contemplating but instead of the rolling tide the arched bridge and the happy islands i saw nothing but the long hollow valley of baghdad with oxen sheep and camels grazing upon the sides of it end of chapter fifty chapter fifty one of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by melissa perry forbearance hast thou named all the birds without a gun loved the wood rose and left it on its stalk at rich men's tables eaten bread and pulse unarmed faced danger with a heart of trust and loved so well a high behaviour in man or maid that thou from speech refrained nobility more nobly to repay oh be my friend and teach me to be thine emerson End of chapter 51. This recording is in the public domain. Section 52 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by April 6090. Mercy to Animals. I would not enter on my list of friends, though graced with polished manners and fine sense yet wanting sensibility the man who needlessly sets foot upon a worm an inadvertent step may crush the snail that crawls at evening in the public path but he that has humanity forewarned will tread aside and let the reptile live the creeping vermin loathsome to the sight and charged perhaps with venom that intrudes a visitor unwelcome into scenes sacred to neatness and repose the alcove the chamber or refectory may die a necessary act incurs no blame the sum is this if man's convenience health or safety interfere his rights and claims are paramount and must extinguish theirs else they are all the meanest things that are as free to live and to enjoy that life as god was free to form them at the first who in his sovereign wisdom made them all ye therefore who love mercy teach your sons to love it too cowper end of chapter fifty two this recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada The United Empire Loyalists The Americans inaugurated their Declaration of Independence by enacting that all the united empire loyalists that is the adherents to connection with the mother country were rebels and traitors they followed the recognition of independence by england with an order exiling such adherents from their territories but while this policy depleted the united states of some of their best blood 
it laid the foundation of the settlement and the institutions of the country which has since become the great free and prosperous dominion of canada upper canada was then unknown or known only as a region of dense wilderness and swamps of venomous reptiles and beasts of prey of numerous and fierce indian tribes of intense cold in winter and with no redeeming feature except abundance of game and fish after the war of independence many loyalists went to nova scotia and new brunswick and settled there the british commander of new york having found out that upper canada was capable of supporting a numerous population along the great river and the lakes undertook to send colonies of loyalists there five vessels were procured and furnished to convey the first colony from new york they sailed round the coasts of nova scotia and new brunswick and up the st lawrence to sorel where they arrived in october seventeen eighty three here they wintered having built themselves huts or shanties and in may seventeen eighty four they continued their voyage in boats and reached their destination cataraki afterwards kingston in the month of july other bands of loyalists came by land over the military highway to lower canada as far as plattsburg and then northward to cornwall and up the st lawrence along the north side of which many of them settled but the most common route was by way of the hudson and the mohawk rivers through oneida lake and down the oswego river to lake ontario flat-bottomed boats specially built or purchased for the purpose by the loyalists were used in this journey the portages over which the boats had to be hauled and all their contents carried are said to have been thirty miles long on reaching oswego some of the loyalists coasted along the eastern shore of lake ontario to kingston and thence up the bay of quint others went westward along the south shore of the lake to niagara and queenston some conveyed their boats over the portage of ten or twelve miles to chippewa thence up the river and into lake erie settling chiefly in what was called long point country now the county of norfolk this journey of hardship privation and exposure occupied from two to three months the obstacles encountered may readily be imagined in a country where the primeval forest covered the earth and where the only path was the river or the lake the parents and family of the writer of this history were from the middle of may to the middle of july making the journey in an open boat generally two or more families would unite in one company and thus assist each other in carrying their boats and goods over the portages these excellent men wrote sir richard bonnycastle were willing to sacrifice life and fortune rather than forego the enviable distinction of being british subjects the stern adherence of the pilgrim fathers to their principles was quite equalled by the stern adherence of the loyalists to their principles but the privations and hardships experienced by many of the loyalist patriots for years after the first settlement in canada were much more severe than anything experienced by the puritans during the first years of their settlement in massachusetts canada has indeed a noble parentage the remembrance of which its inhabitants may well cherish with respect affection and pride egerton ryerson the loyalists of america and their times adapted end of section fifty three this recording is in the public domain section fifty four of the ontario readers fourth book read for librivox dot org by the voice before the void on the North Dakota Saskatchewan border. The Voice Before the Void. Dot net. Oft in the stilly night. Oft in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me. Fond memory brings the light of other days around me. The smiles 
the tears of boyhood's years, the words of love then spoken, the eyes that shone now dimmed and gone, the cheerful hearts now broken. Thus, in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me. When I remember all the friends so linked together, I've seen around me fall like leaves in wintry weather. I feel like one who treads alone some banquet hall deserted, whose lights are fled, whose garlands dead, and all but he departed. Thus, in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me. Thomas Moore End of section 54 This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada The Harp That Once Through Tara's Halls the harp that once through Tara's halls the soul of music shed, now hangs as mute on Tara's walls as if that soul were fled. So sleeps the pride of former days, so glory's thrill is o'er, and hearts that once beat high for praise now feel that pulse no more. No more to chiefs and ladies bright the harp of Tara swells, the chord alone that breaks at night its tale of ruin tells thus freedom now so seldom wakes the only throb she gives is when some heart indignant breaks to show that still she lives more end of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain chapter fifty six of the ontario readers fourth book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Hudson Strait Hudson Strait opens from the Atlantic between Resolution Island on the north and the Button Islands on the south. From point to point this end of the strait is 45 miles wide. At the other end, the west side, between Diggs Island and Nottingham Island, is a distance of 35 miles. From east to west, the straits are 450 miles long wider at the east where the south side is known as ungaba bay contracting at the west to the upper narrows the south side of the strait is labrador the north baffin's land both sides are lofty rocky cavernous shores lashed by a tide that rises in places as high as thirty-five feet and runs in calm weather ten miles an hour pink granite islands dot the north shore in groups that afford harborage but all shores present an adamant front, edges sharp as a knife or else rounded hard to have withstood and cut the tremendous ice jam of a floating world suddenly contracted to forty miles, which Davis Strait pours down at the east end and Fox Channel at the west. Seven hundred feet is considered a good-sized hill, one thousand feet a mountain. Both the north and the south sides of the straits rise two thousand feet in places through these rock walls ice has poured and torn and ripped away since the ice age preceding history cutting a great channel to the atlantic here the iron walls suddenly break to secluded silent valleys moss padded snow edged lonely as the day earth first saw light 
down these valleys pour the clear streams of the eternal snows burnished as silver against the green setting the silence echoing with the tinkle of cataracts over some rock wall or filling the air with the voice of many waters at noontide thaw one old navigator coates describes the beat of the angry tide at the rock base and the silver voice of the mountain brooks like the treble and bass of some great cathedral organ sounding its diapason to the glory of god in this peopleless wilderness perhaps the kayaks of some solitary eskimo lashed abreast twos and threes to prevent capsizing may shoot out from some of these bog-covered valleys like sea-birds but it is only when the eskimos happen to be hunting here or the ships of the whalers and fur traders are passing up and down that there is any sign of human habitation on the straits walrus wallow on the pink granite islands in huge herds polar bears flounder from ice pan to ice pan the arctic hare white as snow but for the great bulging black eye bounds over the boulders snow buntings whistling swans snow geese ducks in myriads flacker and clacker and hold solemn conclave on the adjoining rocks as though this were their realm from the beginning and for all time of a tremendous depth are the waters of the straits not for nothing has the ice world been grinding through this narrow channel for billions of years no fear of shoals to the mariner fear is of another sort when the ice is running in a whirlpool and the incoming tide meets the ice jam and the waters mount thirty-five feet high and a wind roars between the high shores like a bellows then it is that the straits roll and pitch and funnel their waters into black troughs where the ships go down undertow the old hudson's bay captains called the suck of the tide against the ice wall and that black hole where the lumpy billows seemed to part like a passage between wall of ice and wall of water was what the mariners feared the other great danger was just a plain crush getting nipped between two ice pans rearing and plunging like fighting stallions with the ice blocks going off like pistol shots or smashed glass no child's play is such navigating either for the old sailing vessels of the fur traders or the modern icebreakers propelled by steam yet the old sailing vessels and the whaling fleets have navigated these straits for two hundred years agnes c lott the conquest of the great northwest end of chapter fifty six this recording is in the public domain Chapter fifty seven of the Ontario Readers, fourth book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Nemo. Scots wa hae. Scots wa hae wi Wallace bled. Scots wan Bruce has often led. Welcome to your gory bed, or to victory. Now's the day, now's the hour see the front o battle lower see approach proud edward's power chains and slavery what will be a traitor knave what can fill a coward's grave what say bases be a slave let him turn and flee what for scotland's king and law freedom's sword will strongly draw free man stand or free man fall let him follow me by oppression's woes and pains by your sons and servile chains we will drain our dearest veins but they shall be free lie the proud usurpers low tyrants fall in every foe liberties in every blow let us do or dee. Burns. End of chapter fifty seven. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty eight of the Ontario Readers, fourth book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, by Various. St. Ambrose Crew Win Their First Race. The chief characters in this sketch are Miller, the tyrannical little coxswain of the crew, Old Jervis, the captain, Tom Brown, number two, who was rowing his first race, Hardy, a friend of Tom's and one of the best oarsmen in the college, also Jack, the college dog. Though there are several crews in the race, the real struggle is between the boats from St. Ambrose and Exeter Colleges. If St. Ambrose can drive the nose of its boat against the Exeter boat, bump it, it wins. Hark! The first gun! The report set Tom's heart into his mouth again. Several of the boats pushed off at once into the stream, and the crowds of men on the bank began to be agitated, as it were, by the shadow of the coming excitement. The St. Ambrose fingered their oars, put a last dash of grease on their rowlocks, and settled their feet against the stretchers. "'Shall we push her off?' asked Bow. "'No, I can give you another minute,' said Miller, who was sitting, watch in hand, in the stern. "'Only be smart when I give the word.' The captain turned on his seat and looked up the boat. His face was quiet, but full of confidence, which seemed to pass from him into the crew. Tom felt calmer and stronger as he met his eye. "'Now mind, boys, don't quicken,' he said cheerily. Four short strokes to get way on her, and then steady. Here, pass up the lemon.' And he took a sliced lemon out of his pocket, put a small piece in his own mouth, and then handed it to Blake, who followed his example and passed it on. Each man took a piece, and just as Bow had secured the end, Miller called out, "'Now, jackets off, and get her head out steadily.' The jackets were thrown on shore and gathered up by the boatmen in attendance. The crew poised their oars, number two pushing out her head, and the captain doing the same for the stern. Miller took the starting rope in his hand. "'How the wind catches her stern,' he said. "'Here, pay out the rope, one of you. No, not you. Some fellow with a strong hand. Yes, you'll do,' he went on, as Hardy stepped down the bank and took hold of the rope. "'Let me have it, foot by foot, as I want it. Not too quick. Make the most of it. That'll do. Two and three, just dip your oars in to give her way. The rope paid out steadily, and the boat settled to her pace. But now the wind rose again, and the stern drifted in towards the bank. You must back her a bit, Miller, and keep her a little further out, or our oars on stroke side will catch the bank. So I see, curse the wind. Back her, one stroke all. Back her, I say, shouted Miller. It is no easy matter to get a crew to back her an inch just now, particularly as there are in her two men who have never rode a race before, except in the torpids, and one who has never rode a race in his life. However, back she comes. The starting rope slackens in Miller's left hand, and the stroke, unshipping his oar, pushes the stern gently out again. There goes the second gun. One short minute more, and we are off. Short minute, indeed. You wouldn't say so if you were in the boat, with your heart in your mouth, and trembling all over like a man with a palsy. Those sixty seconds before the starting gun in your first race, why, they are a little lifetime. By Jove, we are drifting in again, said Miller, in horror. The captain looked grim, but said nothing. It was too late now for him to be unshipping again. Here, catch hold of the long boat hook and fend her off. Hardy, to whom this was addressed, seized the boat hook, and standing with one foot in the water, pressed the end of the boat hook against the gunwale at the full stretch of his arm, and so, by main force, kept the stern out. There was just room for stroke oars to dip, and that was all. The starting rope was as taut as a harp string. Will Miller's left hand hold out? It is an awful moment. But the coxswain, though almost dragged backwards off his seat, is equal to the occasion. He holds his watch in his right hand with the tiller rope. Eight seconds more only. Look out for the flash. Remember, all eyes in the boat. There it comes, at last, the flash of the starting gun. Long before the sound of the report can roll up the river, the whole pent-up life and energy which has been held in leash, as it were, for the last six minutes, is loose, and breaks away with a bound and a dash which he who has felt it will remember for his life, but the like of which will he ever feel again. The starting ropes drop from the coxswain's hands, the oars flash into the water and gleam on the feather, the spray flies from them, and the boats leap forward. The crowds on the bank scatter and rush along, each keeping as near as may be to his own boat. Some of the men on the towing path, some on the very edge of, often in, the water, some slightly in advance, as if they could help to drag their boat forward, some behind where they can see the pulling better, 
but all at full speed, in wild excitement, and shouting at the top of their voices to those on whom the honor of the college is laid. "'Well pulled, all! Pick her up there, five! You're gaining every stroke! Time in the bows! Bravo, St. Ambrose!' On they rushed by the side of the boats, jostling one another, stumbling, struggling, and panting along. For a quarter of a mile along the bank, the glorious, maddening hurly-burly extends, and rolls up the side of the stream. For the first ten strokes, Tom was in too great fear of making a mistake to feel or hear or see. His whole soul was glued to the back of the man before him, his one thought to keep time and get his strength into the stroke. But as the crew settled down into the well-known long sweep, what we may call consciousness returned, and while every muscle in his body was straining, and his chest heaved, and his heart leaped, every nerve seemed to be gathering new life, and his senses wake into unwanted acuteness. He caught the scent of the wild thyme in the air, and found room in his brain to wonder how it could have got there, as he had never seen the plant near the river, or smelt it before. Though his eyes never wandered from the back of Diogenes, he seemed to see all things at once. The boat behind, which seemed to be gaining, it was all he could do to prevent himself from quickening on the stroke as he fancied that. The eager face of Miller, with his compressed lips, and eyes fixed so earnestly ahead that Tom could almost feel the glance passing over his right shoulder. The flying banks and the shouting crowd. See them with his bodily eyes he could not, but he knew, nevertheless, that Gray had been upset and neatly rolled down the bank into the water in the first hundred yards, that Jack was bounding and scrambling and barking along by the very edge of the stream. Above all, he was just as well aware as if he had been looking at it of a stalwart form in cap and gown, bounding along, brandishing the long boat-hook, and always keeping just opposite the boat, and amid all the babble of voices, and the dash and pulse of the stroke, and the laboring of his own breathing, he heard Hardy's voice coming to him again and again, and clear as if there had been no other sound in the air. Steady, too, steady! Well pulled! Steady, steady! The voice seemed to give him strength and keep him to his work and what work it was! He had had many a hard pull in the last six weeks, but never aught like this. But it can't last forever. Men's muscles are not steel, or their lungs bullhide, and their hearts can't go on pumping a hundred miles an hour long without bursting. The Ambrose boat is well away from the boat behind. There is a great gap between the accompanying crowds, and now, as they near the gut, she hangs for a moment or two in hand, though the roar from the bank grows louder and louder, and Tom is already aware that the St. Ambrose crowd is melting into the one ahead of them. We must be close to Exeter! The thought flashes into him, and it would seem into the rest of the crew at the same moment, for, all at once, the strain seems taken off their arms again. There is no more drag. She springs to the stroke as she did in the start, and Miller's face, which had darkened for a few seconds, lightens up again. Miller's hands and attitude are a study. Coiled up into the smallest possible space, his chin almost resting on his knees, his hands close to his sides, firmly but lightly feeling the rudder, as a good horseman handles the mouth of a free-going hunter. If a coxswain could make a bump by his own exertions, surely he will do it. No sudden jerks of the St. Ambrose rudder will you see, watch as you will from the bank, the boat never hangs through fault of his, but easily and gracefully rounds every point. "'You're gaining, you're gaining!' he now and again mutters to the captain, who responds with a wink keeping his breath for other matters. Isn't he grand, the captain, as he comes forward like lightning, stroke after stroke, his back flat, his teeth set, his whole frame working from the hips with the regularity of a machine. As the space still narrows, the eyes of the fiery little coxswain flash with excitement, but he is far too good a judge to hurry the final effort before the victory is safe in his grasp. The two crowds are mingled now, and no mistake, and the shouts come all in a heap over the water. Now, St. Ambrose, six strokes more! Now, Exeter, you're gaining. Pick her up. Mind the gut, Exeter. Bravo, St. Ambrose. The water rushes by, still eddying from the strokes of the boat ahead. Tom fancies now he can hear their oars and the workings of their rudder and the voice of their coxswain. In another moment, both boats are in the gut, and a perfect storm of shouts reaches them from the crowd as it rushes madly off to the left to the footbridge, amidst which, Oh, well steered, well steered, St. Ambrose, is the prevailing cry. Then Miller, motionless as a statue till now, lifts his right hand and whirls the tassel round his head. Give it to her now, boys. Six strokes and we're into them. Old Jervis lays down that great broad back and lashes his oar through the water with the might of a giant. The crew catch up with him in another stroke. The tight new boat answers to the spurt, and Tom feels a little shock behind him, and then a grating sound as Miller shouts, Unship oars, bow on three! And the nose of the St. Ambrose boat glides quietly up the side of the Exeter, 
till it touches their stroke oar. Take care what you're coming to. It is the coxswain of the bumped boat who speaks. Tom finds himself within a foot or two of him when he looks round, and, being utterly unable to contain his joy, and yet unwilling to exhibit it before the eyes of a gallant rival, turns away towards the shore and begins telegraphing to Hardy. Now then, what are you at there in the bows? Cast her off quick. Come, look alive. Push across at once out of the way of the other boats. I congratulate you, Jervis, says the Exeter stroke as the St. Ambrose boat shoots past him. Do it again next race, and I shan't care. Thomas Hughes, Tom Brown at Oxford. End of chapter 58. Recording by Todd. Chapter 59 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, by Various. The Hunting Song. Waken, lords and ladies gay. On the mountain dawns the day. All the jolly chase is here, with hawk and horse and hunting spear. Hounds are in their couples yelling, hawks are whistling, horns are knelling. Merrily, merrily, mingle, they waken, lords and ladies gay. Waken, lords and ladies gay. The mist has left the mountain gray. Springlets in the dawn are streaming, diamonds on the break are gleaming. And foresters have busy steaming, and foresters have busy been to track the can buck in thicket green. Now we come to chant our lay. Waken, lords and ladies gay. Waken, lords and ladies gay. To the greenwood haste away. We can show you where he lies, fleet of foot and tall of size. We can show the marks he made when gainst the oak in his antlers frayed. You, you shall see him brought to bay. Waken, lords and ladies gay. Louder, louder, chant the lay. Waken, lords and ladies gay. Tell them youth and mirth and glee run, a course as well as we. Time stern huntsman, who can balk, staunch as hound and fleet as the hawk. Think of this and rise this day gentle lords and ladies gay scott it is not what he has nor even what he does which directly expresses the worth of a man but what he is a meal end of section fifty nine recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america chapter sixty of the ontario readers Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Todd. Border Ballad. March, march, Ettrick and Teviot Dale. Why, my lads, dinna ye march forward in order? March, march, Eskdale and Liddesdale. All the blue bonnets are bound for the border. Many a banner spread flutters above your head, many a crest that is famous in story. Mount and make ready then, sons of the mountain glen. Fight for the Queen and our old Scottish glory. Come from the hills where your hirsels are grazing. Come from the glen of the buck and the roe. Come to the crag where the beacon is blazing. Come with the buckler, the lance, and the bow. Trumpets are sounding, war steeds are bounding. Stand to your arms and march in good order. England shall many a day tell of the bloody fray when the blue bonnets came over the border by scott end of chapter sixty this recording is in the public domain chapter sixty one of the ontario readers fourth book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book by Various The Great Northern Diver The weird long call, or the shrill, demoniacal laugh coming out of the night, tells of the sleepless activity of the loon. The whippoorwill in the adjacent shrubbery seems companionable, and there is a friendly spirit in the short, shrill tremolo of the night hawk from the invisible sky. Even the plaint of the screech owl has a tone of human sympathy but the dreary cadence of the loon is the voice of the inhospitable night repelling every thought of human association 
it does not entreat it does not warn yet there is a fascination in its expressionless strength over the black water under the lowering sky or through the bright still moonlight the same unfeeling tone fills the ear of night and sometimes when the lingering moon sheds a broad trail of light along the still waters of the lake the graceful swimmer will glide across and disappear in the darkness breaking the bright reflection into a multitude of chasing quivering trailing threads of silver throughout the day where the cedars come down to meet their shadows in the dark water he swims ceaselessly about sitting low with black glossy neck gracefully curved and displaying its delicate white markings sometimes he stretches himself wearily flapping his wings and displaying his white breast and the handsome showy markings of his sides though wary and aloof and without a trace of animation in his loud penetrating cries he shows his kinship by the scrupulous care with which he preens his handsome feathers even lying on his back in the water to comb out and smooth his glossy white breast a hurried cry from overhead may unexpectedly reveal the presence of a pair of loons in another element and it is always fascinating to watch their steady strained energetic flight above the tops of the pines generally to curve down to some more attractive expanse in the cedar girt lake for the water is the loon's natural element there is an amusing deliberateness in his graceful silent dive he does not make the hurried dip of his smaller cousin the grebe but more calmly curves both neck and body disappearing under the surface in a graceful arch settling down and swimming with only head and neck exposed is an evidence of suspicion and is generally followed by a long dive with a belated reappearance in some remote part of the lake when the mother loon takes her two offspring out for a swim it is a big event in the domestic circle the outing is announced by prolonged and unusual repetitions of the laughing call for half an hour the echoes of the lake are kept alive with sounds portentous of new departures in the loon world then a peculiar object is seen to emerge from the marshy bay and cross under the shadowy cedars toward the open water a field glass shows it to be the mother loon and her two offspring the three huddled so closely together that they are almost indistinguishable the mother is unceasing in her care and attention she strokes the backs of the young birds with her bill playing and fussing around and close to them as if they could not exist without her constant attention now and then she leans over and lifts a broad black webbed foot out of the water holding it up distended as if to endorse the modern theory that the parent loon teaches her young to swim they cling to each other and cling to her as if afraid of being lost in the great expanse of water to which they have been so recently introduced a short distance away the father swims about in lordly indifference diving occasionally and regaling himself on the unsuspecting fish a boat comes out from the shore rowed by an industrious guide with an angler picturesquely protected by mosquito net sitting in the stern the mother loon pushes and urges her indolent pair in the direction of safety how slow they must seem as she hurries and encourages them the trio moves at a snail's pace compared with her ordinary speed but the young ones show no inclination to dive out of harm's way their clinging crowding tendency serves but to incommode and obstruct her and where is the male protector alas for the romance of chivalry when the boat comes near he deliberately dives and after the usual protracted wait reappears in another part of the lake away from the danger that alarms and threatens the defenceless trio but the mother remains and urges the encumbering young things to speed they do make some headway though slowly toward the marshy bay from which they recently emerged with so much loud wild laughter the indifference of the fishermen and the guide does not reassure them and they never cease their entangled struggle till lost to sight in the winding lagoon s t wood End of chapter sixty one
Section 62 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. To the Cuckoo. To the Cuckoo. O blithe newcomer, I have heard, I hear thee and rejoice. O cuckoo, shall I call thee bird, or but a wandering voice? While I am lying on the grass, thy twofold shout I hear. From hill to hill it seems to pass, at once far off and near. Though babbling only to the vale, of sunshine and of flowers, thou bringest unto me a tale of visionary hours. Thrice welcome, darling of the spring, even yet thou art to me, no bird but an invisible thing, a voice, a mystery. The same whom in my schoolboy days I listened to that cry, which made me look a thousand ways in bush and tree and sky to seek thee did i often rove through woods and on the green and thou wert still a hope a love still longed for never seen and i can listen to thee yet can lie upon the plain and listen till i do beget that golden time again o blessed bird the earth we pace again appears to be an unsubstantial fairy place that is fit home for thee. Wordsworth. End of section sixty two. This recording is in the public domain. Section sixty three of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. On the Grasshopper and Cricket On the Grasshopper and Cricket The poetry of earth is never dead When all the birds are faint with the hot sun And hide in cooling trees a voice will run From hedge to hedge about the new-mown mead That is the grasshopper's, he takes the lead In summer luxury he has never done with his delights For when tired out with fun he rests at ease beneath some pleasant weed the poetry of earth is ceasing never on a lone winter evening when the frost has wrought a silence from the stove there shrills the cricket's song in warmth increasing ever and seems to one in drowsiness half lost the grasshoppers among some grassy hills keats end of section sixty three Chapter sixty four of the Ontario Readers, fourth book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Ontario Readers, fourth book by Various. The Great Northwest. And now let us turn our glance to this Great Northwest whither my wandering steps are about to lead me fully nine hundred miles as bird would fly and one thousand two hundred as horse can travel west of red river an immense range of mountains eternally capped with snow rises in rugged masses from a vast stream scarred plain they who first beheld these grand guardians of the central prairies named them the montagne des rochers rocky mountains a fitting title for such vast accumulations of rugged magnificence from the glaciers and ice valleys of this great range of mountains innumerable streams descend into the plains for a time they wander as if heedless of direction through groves and glades and green spreading declivities then assuming greater fixity of purpose they gather up many a wandering rill and start eastward upon a long journey at length the many detached streams resolve themselves into two great water systems through hundreds of miles these two rivers pursue their parallel courses now approaching now opening out from each other suddenly the southern river bends toward the north and at a point some six hundred miles from the mountains pours its volume of water into the northern channel then the united river rolls in vast majestic curves steadily towards the northeast turns once more towards the south opens out into a great reed-covered marsh sweeps on into a large cedar-lined lake 
and finally rolling over a rocky ledge casts its waters into the northern end of the great lake winnipeg fully one thousand three hundred miles from the glacier cradle where it took its birth this river which has along its glorious shores the saskatchewan or rapid flowing river but this saskatchewan is not the only river which drains the great central region between red river and the rocky mountains the assiniboine or stony river drains the rolling prairie lands five hundred miles west from red river and many a smaller stream and rushing bubbling brook carries into its devious channel the waters of that vast country which lies between the american boundary line and the pine woods of the lower saskatchewan so much for the rivers and now for the land through which they flow how shall we picture it how shall we tell the story of that great boundless solitary waste of verdure the old old maps which the navigators of the sixteenth century formed from the discoveries of cabot and cartier of verrazano and hudson played strange pranks with the geography of the new world the coastline with the estuaries of large rivers was tolerably accurate but the centre of america was represented as a vast inland sea whose shores stretched far into the polar north a sea through which lay the much coveted passage to the long-sought treasures of the old realms of cathay well the geographers of that period erred only in the description of ocean which they placed in the centre of the continent for an ocean there is an ocean through which men seek the treasures of cathay even in our own times but the ocean is one of grass and the shores are the crests of mountain ranges and the dark pine forests of sub-arctic regions the great ocean itself does not present such infinite variety as does this prairie ocean of which we speak in winter a dazzling surface of purest snow in early summer a vast expanse of grass and pale pink roses in autumn too often a wild sea of raging fire no ocean of water in the world can vie with its gorgeous sunsets no solitude can equal the loneliness of a night-shadowed prairie one feels the stillness and hears the silence the wail of the prowling wolf makes the voice of solitude audible the stars look down through infinite silence upon a silence almost as intense this ocean has no past time has been naught to it and men have come and gone leaving behind them no track no vestige of their presence some french writer speaking of these prairies has said that the sense of this utter negation of life this complete absence of history has struck him with a loneliness oppressive and sometimes terrible in its intensity perhaps so but for my part the prairies had nothing terrible in their aspect nothing oppressive in their loneliness one saw here the world as it had taken shape and form from the hands of the creator nor did the scene look less beautiful because nature alone tilled the earth and the unaided sun brought forth the flowers october had reached its latest week the wild geese and swans had taken their long flight to the south and their wailing cry no more descended through the darkness ice had settled upon the quiet pools and was settling upon the quick running streams the horizon glowed at night with the red light of moving prairie fires it was the close of the indian summer and winter was coming quickly down from his far northern home major w f butler the great lone land end of chapter sixty four section sixty five of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada rule britannia rule britannia when britain first at heaven's command arose from out the azure main this was the charter of the land and guardian angels sung this strain rule britannia rule the waves britons never will be slaves the nations not so blessed as thee must in their turns to tyrants fall while thou shalt flourish great and free the dread and envy of them all 
still more majestic shalt thou rise more dreadful from each foreign stroke as the loud blast that tears the skies serves but to root thy native oak the haughty tyrants ne'er shall tame all their attempts to bend thee down will but arouse thy generous flame but work their woe and thy renown to thee belongs the rural reign thy cities shall with commerce shine all thine shall be the subject main and every shore it circles thine the muses still with freedom found shall to thy happy coast repair blest isle with matchless beauty crowned and manly hearts to guard the fair rule britannia rule the waves britons never will be slaves james thompson end of section sixty five this recording is in the public domain Chapter sixty six of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The Commandment and the Reward. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck write them upon the table of thine heart so shalt thou find favor and good repute in the sight of god and man trust in the lord with all thine heart and lean not upon thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths be not wise in thine own eyes fear the lord and depart from evil honor the lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy vats shall overflow with new wine proverbs three end of chapter sixty six this recording is in the public domain chapter sixty seven of the ontario readers fourth book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The Spacious Firmament. The spacious firmament on high with all the blue ethereal sky, and spangled heavens, a shining frame, their great original proclaim. The unwearied sun from day to day does his creator's power display, and publishes to every land the work of an almighty hand soon as the evening shades prevail the moon takes up the wondrous tale and nightly to the listening earth repeats the story of her birth whilst all the stars that round her burn and all the planets in their turn confirm the tidings as they roll and spread the truth from pole to pole what though in solemn silence all move round the dark terrestrial ball what though no real voice nor sound amid their radiant orbs be found in reason's ear they all rejoice and utter forth a glorious voice forever singing as they shine the hand that made us is divine addison end of chapter sixty seven this recording is in the public domain section sixty eight of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for LibriVox .org by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada june june what is so rare as a day in june then if ever come perfect days then heaven tries earth if it be in tune and over it softly her warm ear lays whether we look or whether we listen we hear life murmur or see it glisten every clod feels a stir of might an instinct within it that reaches and towers and groping blindly above it for light climbs to a soul in grass and flowers the flush of life may well be seen thrilling back over hills and valleys the cowslip startles in meadows green the buttercup catches the sun in its chalice and there's never a leaf nor a blade too mean to be some happy creature's palace the little bird sits at his door in the sun a tilt like a blossom among the leaves 
and lets his illumined being o'errun with the deluge of summer it receives his mate feels the eggs beneath her wings and the heart in her dumb breast flutters and sings he sings to the wide world and she to her nest in the nice ear of nature which song is the best now is the high tide of the year and whatever of life hath ebbed away comes flooding back with a ripply cheer into every bare inlet and creek and bay now the heart is so full that a drop overfills it we are happy now because god wills it no matter how barren the past may have been tis enough for us now that the leaves are green we sit in the warm shade and feel right well how the sap creeps up and the blossoms swell we may shut our eyes but we cannot help knowing that skies are clear and grass is growing the breeze comes whispering in our ear that dandelions are blossoming near that maize has sprouted the streams are flowing that the river is bluer than the sky that the robin is plastering his house hard by and if the breeze kept the good news back for other couriers we should not lack we could guess it all by yon heifers lowing and hark how clear bold chanticleer warmed with the new wine of the year tells all in his lusty crowing lowell end of section sixty eight this recording is in the public domain Chapter sixty nine of the Ontario Readers, fourth book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ontario Readers, fourth book, by Various. Chapter sixty nine The Fifth Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor all the troubles and calamities i had undergone could not cure me of my inclination to make new voyages i therefore bought goods departed with them for the best seaport and there that i might not be obliged to depend upon a captain but have a ship at my own command i remained till one was built on purpose at my own charge when the ship was ready i went on board with my goods but not having enough to load her i agreed to take with me several merchants of different nations with their merchandise we sailed with the first fair wind and after a long navigation the first place we touched at was a desert island where we found an egg of a rock equal in size to that i saw on a former voyage fifty paces round and shining as a great white dome when seen even from afar there was a young rock in it just ready to be hatched and its bill had begun to appear the merchants whom i had taken on board and who landed with me broke the egg with hatchets and having made a hole in it pulled out the young rock piecemeal and roasted it i had earnestly entreated them not to meddle with the egg but they would not listen to me scarcely had they finished their repast when there appeared in the air at a considerable distance from us two great clouds the captain whom i had hired to navigate my ship knowing by experience what they meant said they were the male and female rock that belonged to the young one and pressed us to re-embark with all speed to prevent the misfortune which he saw would otherwise befall us we hastened on board and set sail with all possible expedition in the meantime the two rocks approached with a frightful noise which they redoubled when they saw the egg broken and their young one gone they flew back in the direction they had come and disappeared for some time while we made all the sail we could to endeavour to prevent that which unhappily befell us they soon returned and we observed that each of them carried between its talons stones or rather rocks of a monstrous size when they came directly over my ship they hovered and one of them let fall a stone but by the dexterity of the steersman it missed us and falling into the sea divided the water so that we could almost see the bottom the other rock to our misfortune 
threw his massy burden so exactly into the middle of the ship as to split it into a thousand pieces the mariners and passengers were all crushed to death or sunk i myself was of the number of the latter but as i came up again i fortunately caught hold of a piece of the wreck and swimming sometimes with one hand and sometimes with the other but always holding fast my board the wind and tide favouring me i came to an island whose shore was very steep i overcame that difficulty however and got ashore i sat down upon the grass to recover myself from my fatigue after which i went into the island to explore it it seemed to be a delicious garden i found trees everywhere some of them bearing green and others ripe fruits and there were streams of fresh pure water running in pleasant meanders i ate of the fruits which i found excellent and drank of the water which was very light and good when i was a little advanced into the island i saw an old man who appeared very weak and infirm he was sitting on the bank of a stream and at first i took him to be one who had been shipwrecked like myself i went towards him and saluted him but he only slightly bowed his head i asked him why he sat so still but instead of answering me he made a sign for me to take him upon my back and carry him over the brook signifying that it was to gather fruit i believed him really to stand in need of my assistance took him upon my back and having carried him over bade him get down and for that end stooped that he might get off with ease but instead of doing so which i laugh at every time i think of it the old man who appeared to me quite decrepit threw his legs nimbly about my neck he sat astride upon my shoulders and held my throat so tight that i thought he would have strangled me the apprehension of which made me swoon and fall down notwithstanding my fainting the ill-natured old fellow kept fast about my neck when i had recovered my breath he thrust one of his feet against my stomach and struck me so rudely on the side with the other that he forced me to rise up against my will having arisen he made me carry him under the trees and forced me now and then to stop to gather and eat fruit such as we found he never left me all day and when i lay down to rest at night he laid himself down with me holding always fast about my neck every morning he pushed me to make me awake and afterwards obliged me to get up and walk and pressed me with his feet you may judge then what trouble i was in to be loaded with such a burden of which i could not get rid one day i found in my way several dry calabashes that had fallen from a tree i took a large one and after cleaning it pressed into it some juice of grapes which abounded in the island having filled the calabash i put it by in a convenient place and going thither again some days after i tasted it and found the wine so good that it soon made me forget my sorrow gave me new vigour and so exhilarated my spirits that i began to sing and dance as i walked along the old man perceiving the effect which this liquor had upon me and that i carried him with more ease than before made me a sign to give him some of it i handed him the calabash and the liquor pleasing his palate he drank it all off there being a considerable quantity of it and the fumes getting into his head he began to sing and dance upon my shoulders and to loosen his legs from about me by degrees finding that he did not press me as before i threw him upon the ground where he lay without motion then i took up a great stone and crushed his head i was extremely glad to be thus freed for ever from this troublesome fellow i now walked towards the beach where i met the crew of a ship that had cast anchor to take water they were surprised to see me but more so at the particulars of my adventures you fell said they into the hands of the old man of the sea 
and are the first who ever escaped strangling by his malicious tricks he never quitted those he had once made himself master of till he had destroyed them and he has made this island notorious by the number of men he has slain after having informed me of these things they carried me with them to the ship the captain received me with great kindness when they told him what had befallen me he put out again to sea and after some days sail we arrived at the harbour of a great city the houses of which were built with hewn stone one of the merchants who had taken me into his friendship invited me to go along with him and carried me to a place appointed for the accommodation of foreign merchants he gave me a large bag and having recommended me to some people of the town who used to gather coconuts desired them to take me with them go said he follow them and act as you see them do but do not part from them otherwise you may endanger your life having thus spoken he gave me provisions for the journey and i went with them we came to a thick forest of cocoa trees very lofty with trunks so smooth that it was not possible to climb to the branches that bore the fruit when we entered the forest we saw a great number of apes of several sizes who fled as soon as they perceived us and climbed up to the tops of the trees with surprising swiftness the merchants gathered stones and threw them at the apes in the trees i did the same and the apes out of revenge threw coconuts at us so fast and with such gestures as sufficiently testified their anger and resentment we gathered up the coconuts and from time to time threw stones to provoke the apes so that by this stratagem we filled our bags with coconuts which it had been impossible otherwise to have done i thus gradually collected as many coconuts as produced me a considerable sum we sailed towards the islands where pepper grows in great plenty from thence we went to the isle of comari where the best species of wood of aloes grows i exchanged my cocoa in those islands for pepper and wood of aloes and went with other merchants a pearl fishing i hired divers who brought me up some that were very large and pure i embarked in a vessel that happily arrived at Basra. from thence i returned to bagdad where i made vast sums of my pepper wood of aloes and pearls i gave the tenth of my gains in arms as i had done upon my return from my other voyages and endeavoured to dissipate my fatigues by amusements of different kinds the arabian nights entertainments all are needed by each one nothing is fair or good alone i thought the sparrow's note from heaven singing at dawn on the alder bough i brought him home in his nest at even he sings the song but it cheers not now for i did not bring home the river and sky he sang to my ear they sang to my eye emerson end of chapter sixty nine Chapter Seventy of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book, recording for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Ocean. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean, roll. Ten thousand fleets sweep over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin; his control stops with the shore. Upon the watery plain, the wrecks are all thy deed nor doth remain a shadow of man's ravage save his own when for a moment like a drop of rain he sinks into thy depths with bubbling groan without a grave unnailed uncoffined and unknown his steps are not upon thy paths thy fields are not a spoil for him thou dost arise and shake him from thee the vile strength he wields for earth's destruction thou dost all despise spurning him from thy bosom to the skies 
and sensed him shivering in thy playful spray and howling to his gods where haply lies his petty hope in some near port or bay and dashest him again to earth there let him lay the armaments which thunder strike the walls of rock-built cities bidding nations quake and monarchs tremble in their capitals the oak leviathans whose huge ribs make their clay creator the vain title take of lord of thee an arbiter of war these are thy toys and as the snowy flake they melt into the yeast of waves which mar alike the armada's pride or spoils of trafalgar thy shores are empires changed in all save thee assyria greece rome carthage what are they thy waters washed them power while they were free and many a tyrant since their shores obey the stranger slave or savage their decay has dried up realms to deserts not so thou unchangeable save to thy wild waves play time writes no wrinkle on thine azure brow such as creation's dawn beheld thou rollest now thou glorious mirror where the almighty's form glasses itself in tempests in all time calm or convulsed in breeze or gale or storm icing the pole or in the torrid clime dark heaving boundless endless and sublime the image of eternity the throne of the invisible even from out thy slime the monsters of the deep are made each zone obeys thee thou goest forth dread fathomless alone and i have loved thee ocean and my joy of youthful sports was on thy breast to be borne like the bubbles onward from a boy i wantoned with thy breakers they to me were a delight and if the freshening sea made them a terror twas a pleasing fear for i was as it were a child of thee and trusted to thy billows far and near and laid my hand upon thy mane as i do here byron child harold's pilgrimage britain's myriad voices call sons bewelded each and all into one imperial whole one with britain heart and soul one life one flag one fleet one throne britons hold your own tennyson end of chapter seventy this recording is in the public domain chapter seventy one of the ontario readers fourth book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ellery davidson pontiac's attempt to capture fort detroit in the year seventeen sixty three a celebrated chief of the ottawas called pontiac succeeded in forming a confederacy of the ottawas hurons chippewas and some other tribes with the avowed object of expelling the british from the lake regions of the country with the craftiness peculiar to the indian race an ingenious stratagem was devised by means of which it was hoped that the allies would easily gain possession of the forts for this purpose a grand lacrosse match was organized at each post and the officers of the garrison invited to become participators in the game pontiac and his attendant chiefs had while the warriors and braves were engaged in the game of lacrosse on the common sought an audience of the governor of the fort he received them in the mess-room apparently not suspecting any artifice on their part the pale warrior the friend of the ottawa chief is not here said the governor as he glanced his eye along the semicircle of indians how is this is his voice still sick that he cannot come or has the great chief of the ottawas forgotten to tell him the voice of the pale warrior is still sick and he cannot speak replied the indian the ottawa chief is very sorry for the tongue of his friend the pale face is full of wisdom scarcely had the last words escaped his lips 
when a wild shrill cry from without the fort rang on the ears of the assembled council and caused a momentary commotion among the officers it arose from a single voice and that voice could not be mistaken by any who had heard it once before a second or two during which the officers and chiefs kept their eyes intently fixed on one another passed anxiously away and then nearer to the gate apparently on the very drawbridge itself was pealed forth the wild and deafening yell of a legion of fiendish voices at that sound the ottawa and the other chiefs sprang to their feet and their own fierce cry responded to that yet vibrating on the ears of all already were their gleaming tomahawks brandished wildly over their heads and pontiac had even bounded a pace forward to reach the governor with the deadly weapon when at the sudden stamping of the foot of the ladder upon the floor the scarlet cloth in the rear was thrown aside and twenty soldiers their eyes glancing along the barrels of their levelled muskets met the startled gaze of the astonished indians an instant was enough to satisfy the keen chief of the true state of the case the calm composed mien of the officers not one of whom had even attempted to quit his seat amid the din by which his ears were so alarmingly assailed the triumphant yet dignified and even severe expression of the governor's countenance and above all the unexpected presence of the prepared soldiery all these at once assured him of the discovery of his treachery and the danger that awaited him the necessity for an immediate attempt to join his warriors without was now obvious to the ottawa and scarcely had he conceived the idea before he sought to execute it in a single spring he gained the door of the mess-room and followed eagerly and tumultuously by the other chiefs to whose departure no opposition was offered in the next moment stood on the steps of the piazza that ran along the front of the building whence he had issued the surprise of the indians on reaching this point was now too powerful to be dissembled and incapable either of advancing or receding they remained gazing on the scene before them with an air of mingled stupefaction rage and alarm scarcely ten minutes had elapsed since they had proudly strode through the naked area of the fort and yet even in that short space of time its appearance had been entirely changed not a part was there now of the surrounding buildings that was not replete with human life and hostile preparation through every window of the officers low rooms was to be seen the dark and frowning muzzle of a field piece bearing upon the gateway and behind these were artillerymen holding their lighted matches supported again by files of bayonets that glittered in their rear in the blockhouses the same formidable array of field pieces and muskets was visible while from the four angles of the square as many heavy guns that had been artfully masked at the entrance of the chiefs seemed ready to sweep away everything that should come before them the guard-room near the gate presented the same hostile front the doors of this as well as of the other buildings had been firmly secured within and from every window affording cover to the troops gleamed a line of bayonets rising above the threatening field pieces pointed at a distance of little more than twelve feet directly upon the gateway in addition to his musket each man of the guard held a hand grenade provided with the short fuse that could be ignited in a moment from the matches of the gunners with immediate effect the soldiers in the blockhouses were similarly provided almost magical as was the change thus suddenly effected in the appearance of the garrison it was not the most interesting feature in the exciting scene choking up the gateway in which they were completely wedged and crowding the drawbridge a dense mass of husky indians were to be seen casting their fierce glances around yet paralyzed in their movements by the unlooked-for display of resisting force threatening instant annihilation to those who should attempt either to advance or recede never perhaps were astonishment and disappointment more forcibly depicted on the human countenance than they were now exhibited by these men who had already in imagination secured to themselves an easy conquest they were the warriors who had so recently been engaged in the manly yet innocent exercise of the ball but instead of the harmless hurdle each now carried a short gun in one hand and a gleaming tomahawk in the other after the first general yelling heard in the council room not a sound was uttered their burst of rage and triumph had evidently been checked by the unexpected manner of their reception 
and they now stood on the spot on which the further advance of each had been arrested so silent and motionless that but for the rolling of their dark eyes as they keenly measured the insurmountable barriers that were opposed to their progress they might almost have been taken for a wild group of statuary conspicuous at the head of these was he who wore the blanket a tall warrior on whom rested the startled eye of every officer and soldier who was so situated as to behold him his face was painted black as death and as he stood under the arch of the gateway with his white turbaned head towering far above those of his companions this formidable and mysterious enemy might have been likened to the spirit of darkness presiding over his terrible legions in order to account for the extraordinary appearance of the indians armed in every way for death at a moment when neither gun nor tomahawk was apparently within miles of their reach it was necessary to revert to the first entrance of the chiefs into the fort the fall of pontiac had been the effect of design and the yell pealed forth by him on recovering his feet as if in taunting reply to the laugh of his comrades was in reality a signal intended for the guidance of the indians without these now following up their game with increasing spirit at once changed the direction of their line bringing the ball nearer to the fort in their eagerness to effect this object they had overlooked the gradual secession of the unarmed troops spectators of their sport from the ramparts until scarcely more than twenty stragglers were left as they neared the gate the squaws broke up their several groups and forming a line on either hand of the road leading to the drawbridge appeared to separate solely with a view not to impede the players for an instant a dense group collected around the ball which had been drawn to within a hundred yards of the gate and fifty hurdles were crossed in their endeavor to secure it when the warrior who formed the solitary exception to the multitude in his blanket covering and who had been lingering in the extreme rear of the party came rapidly up to the spot where the well-affected struggle was maintained at his approach the hurdles of the other players were withdrawn when at a single blow from his powerful arm the ball was seen flying in an oblique direction and was for a moment lost altogether to the view when it again met the eye it was descending into the very centre of the fort with the fleetness of thought now commenced a race which had ostensibly for its object the recovery of the lost ball in which he who had driven it with resistless force outstripped them all their course lay between the two lines of squaws and scarcely had the head of the bounding indians reached the opposite extremity of those lines when the women suddenly threw back their blankets and disclosed each a short gun and tomahawk to throw away their hurdles and seize upon these was the work of an instant already in imagination was the fort their own and such was the peculiar exultation of the black and turbaned warrior when he felt the planks of the drawbridge bending beneath his feet all the ferocious joy of his soul was peeled forth in the terrible cry which rapidly succeeded by that of the other indians had resounded so fearfully through the council room what their disappointment was when on gaining the interior they found the garrison prepared for the reception has already been shown end of chapter seventy one Section 72 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada My Native Land My Native Land Breathe there the man with soul so dead Who never to himself hath said This is my own, my native land Whose heart hath ne'er within him burned As home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand if such there breathe go mark him well for him no minstrel raptures swell high though his titles proud his name boundless his wealth as wish can claim despite those titles power and pelf the wretch concentred all in self living shall forfeit fair renown and doubly dying shall go down to the vile dust from whence he sprung unwept unhonored and unsung scott the lay of the last minstrel end of section seventy two
This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 73 of The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Morning on the Livre. Far above us, where a jay screams his matin to the day, capped with gold and amethyst, like a vapor from the forge of a giant somewhere hid out of hearing of the clang of his hammer skirts of mist slowly up the woody gorge lift and hang softly as a cloud we go sky above and sky below down the river and the dip of the paddle scarcely breaks with the little silvery drip of the water as it shakes from the blades the crystal deep of the silence of the morn of the forest yet asleep and the river reaches born in a mirror purple gray sheer away to the misty line of light where the forest and the stream in the shadow meet and plight like a dream from amid a stretch of reeds where the lazy river sucks all the water as it bleeds from a little curling creek and the muskrats peer and sneak in around the sunken wrecks of a tree that swept the skies long ago on a sudden seven ducks with a splashy rustle rise stretching out their seven necks one before and two behind and the others all a row and as steady as the wind with a swiveling whistle go through the purple shadow led till we only hear their whir in behind a rocky spur just ahead archibald lampman i call therefore a complete and generous education that which fits a man to perform justly skilfully and magnanimously all the offices both private and public of peace and war milton on education end of chapter seventy three this recording is in the public domain Chapter seventy four of the Ontario Readers, fourth book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Alethea. Evening. From upland slopes I see the cows file by, lowing, great chested, down the homeward trail. By dusking fields and meadows shining pale with moon tipped dandelions. Flickering high, a peevish night-hawk in the western sky beats up into the loosened solitudes or drops with grinding wing the stilly woods grow dark and deep and gloom mysteriously cool night winds creep and whisper in mine ear the homely cricket gossips at my feet from far-off pools and wastes of reeds i hear clear and soft piped the chanting frogs break sweet in full pandean chorus one by one shine out the stars and the great night comes on archibald lampman for manners are not idle but the fruit of loyal nature and of noble mind tennyson end of chapter seventy four this recording is in the public domain Section 75 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. The Ontario Reader's Fourth Book by Various. Section 75. An Elizabethan Seaman. Some two miles above the port of Dartmouth, once among the most important harbours in England, on a projecting angle of land which runs out into the river at the head of one of its most beautiful reaches, there has stood for some great centuries the manor house of Greenaway. The water runs deep all the way to it from the sea, and the largest vessels may ride with safety within a stone's throw of the windows. In the latter half of the sixteenth century there must have met in the hall of this mansion a party as remarkable as could have been found anywhere in england humphrey and adrian gilbert 
with their half-brother Walter Raleigh, here, when little boys, played at sailors in the reaches of Longstream, in the summer evenings doubtless rowing down with the tide to the port, and wondering at the quaint figureheads and carved prows of the ships which thronged it, or climbing on board and listening, with hearts beating, to the mariners' tales of the new earth beyond the sunset, and here in later life matured men whose boyish dreams had become heroic action they used again to meet in the intervals of quiet and the rock is shown underneath the house where raleigh smoked the first tobacco another remarkable man could not fail to have made a fourth at these meetings a sailor boy of sandwich the adjoining parish john davis showed early a genius which could not have escaped the eye of such neighbours and in the atmosphere of Greenaway he learned to be as noble as the Gilberts and as tender and delicate as Raleigh. In 1585 John Davis left Dartmouth on his first voyage into the polar seas, and twice subsequently he went again, venturing in small ill-equipped vessels of thirty or forty tons into the most dangerous seas. These voyages were as remarkable for their success as for the daring with which they were accomplished and davis's epitaph is written on the map of the world where his name still remains to commemorate his discoveries brave as he was he is distinguished by a peculiar and exquisite sweetness of nature which from many little facts of his life seems to have affected every one with whom he came in contact in a remarkable degree we find men for the love of master davis leaving their firesides to sail with him without other hope or motion we find silver bullets cast to shoot him in a mutiny the hard rude natures of the mutineers being awed by something in his carriage which was not like that of a common man he has written the account of one of his northern voyages himself and there is an imaginative beauty in it and a rich delicacy of expression which is called out in him by the first sight of strange lands and things and people we have only space to tell something of the conclusion of his voyage north in latitude sixty three degrees he fell in with a barrier of ice which he coasted for thirteen days without finding an opening the very sight of an iceberg was new to all his crew and the ropes and shrouds though it was midsummer becoming compassed with ice the people began to fall sick and faint-hearted whereupon very orderly and with good discretion they entreated me to regard the safety of mine own life, as well as the preservation of theirs, and that I should not, through overboldness, leave their widows and fatherless children to give me bitter curses. Whereupon, seeking counsel of God, it pleased His Divine Majesty to move my heart to prosecute that which I hope shall be to His glory and to the contentation of every Christian mind. He had two vessels, one of some burden, the other a pinnace of thirty tons. The result of the counsel which he had sought was that he made over his own large vessel to such as wished to return, and himself, thinking it better to die with honour than to return with infamy, went on with such volunteers as would follow him, in a poor leaky cutter, up the sea now in commemoration of that adventure called Davis's Strait he ascended four degrees north of the furthest known point among storms and icebergs when the long days and twilight nights alone saved him from being destroyed and coasting back along the american shore he discovered hudson strait supposed then to be the long desired entrance into the pacific this exploit drew the attention of walsingham and by him davis was presented to burley who was also pleased to show him great encouragement if either these statesmen or elizabeth had been twenty years younger his name would have filled a larger space in history than a small corner of the map of the world but if he was employed at all in the last years of the century no vates sasser has been found to celebrate his work and no clue is left to guide us he disappears a cloud falls over him he is known to have commanded trading vessels in the eastern seas and to have returned five times from india but the details are all lost and accident has only parted the clouds for a moment 
to show us the mournful setting with which he too went down upon the sea in taking out sir edward mitchelthorne to india in sixteen o four he fell in with a crew of japanese whose ship had been burnt drifting at sea without provisions in a leaky junk he supposed them to be pirates but he did not choose to leave them to so wretched a death and took them on board and in a few hours watching their opportunity they murdered him as the fool dieth so dieth the wise and there is no difference it was the chance of the sea and the ill reward of a humane action a melancholy end for such a man like the end of a warrior not dying epaminondas like on the field of victory but cut off in some poor brawl or ambuscade and so it was with all these men they were cut off in the flower of their days and few of them laid their bones in the sepulchres of their fathers they knew the service which they had chosen and they did not ask the wages for which they had not labored life with them was no summer holiday but a holy sacrifice offered up to duty and what their master sent was welcome beautiful is old age beautiful is the slow dropping mellow autumn of a rich glorious summer in the old man nature has fulfilled her work she loads him with her blessings she fills him with the fruits of a well-spent life and surrounded by his children and his children's children she rocks him softly away to a grave to which he is followed with blessings god forbid we should not call it beautiful it is beautiful but not the most beautiful there is another life hard rough and thorny trodden with bleeding feet and aching brow the life of which the cross is the symbol a battle which no peace follows this side of the grave which the grave gapes to finish before the victory is won and strange that it should be so this is the highest life of man look back along the great names of history there is none whose life has been other than this they to whom it has been given to do the really highest work in this earth whoever they are jew or gentile pagan or christian warriors legislators philosophers priests poets kings slaves one and all their fate has been the same the same bitter cup has been given them to drink and so it was with the servants of england in the sixteenth century their life was a long battle either with the elements or with men and it was enough for them to fulfil their work and to pass away in the hour when god had nothing more to bid them do Froud, short studies on great subjects end of section seventy five chapter seventy six of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by larry wilson the sea king's burial my strength is failing fast said the sea king to his men i shall never sail the seas as a conqueror again but while yet a drop remains of the life-blood in my veins raise o oh, raise me from the bed put the crown upon my head put my good sword in my hand and so lead me to the strand where my ship at anchor rides steadily if i cannot end my life in the crimson battle strife let me die as i have lived on the sea they have raised king balder up put his crown upon his head they have sheathed his limb in mail and the purple o'er him spread and amid the greeting rude of a gathering multitude borne him slowly to the shore all the energy of yore from his dim eyes flashing forth old sea lion of the north as he looked upon his ship riding free and on his forehead pale felt the cold refreshing gale and heard the welcome sound of the sea they have borne him to the ship with a slow and solemn tread they have placed him on the deck with his crown upon his head where he sat as on a throne and have left him there alone with his anchor ready weighed and his snowy sails displayed to the favoring wind once more blowing freshly from the shore and have bidden him farewell tenderly saying king of mighty men 
we shall meet thee again in valhalla with the monarchs of the sea underneath him in the hold they have placed the lighted brand and the fire was burning slow as the vessel from the land like a staghound from the slips darted forth from out the ships there was music in her sail as it swelled before the gale and a dashing at her prow as it cleft the waves below and the good ship sped along scudding free as on many a battle morn in her time she had been born to struggle and to conquer on the sea and the king with sudden strength started up and paced the deck with his good sword for his staff and his robe around his neck once alone he raised his hand to the people on the land and with a shout of joyous cry once again they made reply till the loud exulting cheer sounded faintly on his ear for the gale was o'er him blowing fresh and free and ere yet an hour had passed he was driven before the blast and a storm was on his path on the sea so blow ye tempests blow and my spirit shall not quail i have fought with many a foe and have weathered many a gale and in this hour of death ere i yield my fleeting breath ere the fire now burning slow shall come rushing from below as this worn and wasted frame be devoted to the flame i will raise my voice in triumph singing free to the great all-father's home i am driving through the foam i am sailing to valhalla o'er the sea so blow ye stormy winds and ye flames ascend on high in the easy idle bed let the slave and coward die but give me the driving keel clang of shields and flashing steel happy happy thus i'd yield on the deck or in the field my last breath shouting on to victory but since this has been denied they shall say that i have died without flinching like a monarch of the sea and balder spoke no more and no sound escaped his lip neither wrecked he the roar the destruction of his ship nor the fleet sparks mounting high nor the glare upon the sky scarcely heard the billows dash nor the burning timber crash scarcely felt the scorching heat that was gathering at his feet nor the fierce flames mounting o'er him greedily but the life was in him yet and the courage to forget all his pain in his triumph on the sea once alone a cry arose half of anguish half of pride as he sprang upon his feet with the flames on every side i am coming said the king where the swords and the bucklers ring where the warrior lives again with the souls of mighty men i am coming great all-father unto thee unto odin unto thor and the strong two hearts of yore i am coming to valhalla o'er the sea charles mckay reading enables us to see with the keenest eyes to hear with the finest ears and listen to the sweetest voices of all time lowell end of chapter seventy six this recording is in the public domain